So now we switch to the poster flash session, and we have here on the board uh, the list of uh, speakers. Uh, so uh, each one is given three minutes, and uh, when, when someone is speaking, so the next one should uh, be prepared uh, to start afterwards. We will have uh, a stopper, and there will be some annoying noise after three minutes, and uh, that's it. Uh, okay, so thank you. Uh, so this is the name of my poster, uh, which is work done together with Philipp Lange and Peter Kopiec, mainly in Frankfurt, but I just moved to Leipzig, so in so so Leipzig. Uh, and what we considered, and what I'll be presenting, is something very generic, uh, namely just a two-dimensional Fermi liquid in a magnetic field, in a Zeeman magnetic field even. Uh, so when we usually think of Fermi liquids, what we think of is essentially a gas of essentially non-interacting quasi particles. Uh, which have the same quantum numbers as a free Fermi gas, except that they're renormalized. So if I now switch on a magnetic field or go to finite temperatures, what I might expect is that, well, I should get some familiar Sommerfeld type expansions, for instance, for the heat capacity divided by temperature or for the susceptibility. Um, so however, this turns out not to be entirely correct beyond leading order. Uh, so for instance, in two dimensions, what you find is that both this heat capacity divided by temperature and uh, spin susceptibility uh, become linear in either temperature or magnetic field, whichever one is the higher energy scale. Uh, and in particular, they become non-analytic in this uh, magnetic field. Um, so what you now might ask is, well, does this also happen for other quantities, such as various quasi-particle properties, like the long DG factor or the renormalized mass, which themselves are very fundamental for the Fermi liquid theory? Uh, and well, okay, the answer is obviously at least partially yes, uh, because otherwise I wouldn't be uh, talking about this and presenting this. Um, and how the way they occur, these non elasticities is through renormalization factors uh, of, uh, within perturbation theory. So for, in, uh, for instance, via the quasi-particle residue. So, what we, so we calculate these non elasticities and we show how you can classify them fully uh, within a low energy theory, which takes into account uh, scattering in all possible scattering channels uh, close to the Fermi surface. Um, and we, we also discuss how you may be able to observe these in experiments. So, for instance, they will appear in the tunneling density of states and in the conductivity, uh, both at finite magnetic, magnetic field and uh, temperature. Um, so, if you're interested in this or have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss with you during the post session. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Ilya Yesin, and uh, I'm uh, from the Technion, and uh, today I present a poster about uh, transport properties of uh, Fluquet insulators. This work uh, was done in uh, collaboration with uh, Daniel Lindner and, uh, from the Technion and Mark Rudner uh, from uh, Niels Bohr Institute. Uh, in this work, we studied tra transport properties in the steady state of resonantly uh, periodically driven systems. So this is the setup that we consider. It consists of a Floquet insulator wire that is coupled to a bath of uh, bosons, uh, phonons and photons, that stabilize the, the um, occupation in, uh, inside the uh, uh, Floquet insulator. And at its edge, it is coupled to two leads that create a chemical potential difference and allows uh, a current to flow. So in this work, we uh, want to uh, calculate the current. What is the current through this uh, Floquet insulator wire? And uh, basically, we, we would like to, to answer the question, are Floquet insulators really insulating? Um, and maybe to find conditions when it happens. So we derived a Boltzmann equation that uh, includes uh, processes that are unique for Floquet systems, for example, electron hole recombination where electron can emit a photon and uh, decay to higher uh, Floquet energy level. We also include the uh, processes of uh, phonon relaxation and uh, near the leads, uh, there may be a tunneling from or to the leads, and of course, uh, uh, the Boltzmann equation also includes inquiry and transfer to, through the uh, uh, um, wire. 
So uh, let's go to the bottom line of our work. So what is the answer? Are Floquet insulators indeed insulating? And uh, so the short answer is yes. Uh, the medium answer is we uh, made simulations and found uh, the uh, diffusion and, con and the drift conductances for this wire. And we found that for specific uh, parameters, these two conductances go to zero. And uh, if you want to hear a long answer, you are welcome to visit my poster. Thank you. I just ruined it. Hi, I'm Cosma from Weizmann, and if you come see my poster, I'm going to tell you about physics at the edge of a weak topological superconductor. This is work done together with Ashley Milstead, Luis Seabra, Carlo Benacke, and Emilio Cobanera. And it's about the phase diagram and interaction effects in a topological superconductor very similar to the Kitaev chain. In the Kitaev chain, you have a one-dimensional system of fermionic sites, which are these big blobs, and each fermion is two Majoranas, so these little red dots. The behavior of the system, its phase diagram, and the effects of interactions are hugely influenced in the Kitaev chain by the fact that these Majoranas remember where they came from. Different coupling terms between the Majoranas and the different effects of interaction terms depend on what is the physical origin behind the coupling between Majoranas. For instance, the coupling between the first two can be traced back to a chemical potential term, while the second coupling, the one with a, with a horizontal line, it can be traced back to a hopping or pairing term in the, uh, in the uh, fermionic language. We're going to see how this behavior changes the phase diagram of the system when you consider a different one-dimensional system that formed at the edge of a weak topological superconductor. Rather than making Majoranas out of fermionic sites, we add Majoranas one at a time, each one independently coming from the edge, from the end of a one-dimensional Majorana nanowire. In such a system, all Majoranas are born equal. In this Majorana democracy, all hoppings between them are statistically equivalent, and we're going to see that this leads to different physics and different phase diagram than would happen for the Kitaev chain. In particular, while interactions in the Kitaev chain favor localization, in this system, you, uh, you will see that uh, the Kitaev edge remains delocalized even for very strong interaction strength. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hadar Greener. I'm from Alec Palevsky's group here at Tel Aviv University. My poster is about my work on the proximity effect in superconducting ferromagnetic granular structures. So we wanted to study the effect of ferromagnetic grains on superconducting grains. So I fabricated two different sample sets of varying superconducting to ferromagnetic ratios, with nickel being our ferromagnet and lead being our superconductor, and measured, among other things, the critical temperature of each and every one of the samples. Here you can see a typical micrograph of one of my granular sam samples, and this is our hall bar uh, for which uh, we performed our measurements. And in this graph of Tc as a function of the relative volume concentration of each and every one of our samples, uh, two things are very noticeable. The first being, that the decay of TC as a function of the amount of ferromagnetic grains that you have in, one of our, in each and every one of our samples is rather slow. Um, starting from around 25% uh, uh, nickel concentration, you can see that the critical temperature saturates at a value of around 1.3 Kelvin and not zero. The second thing that, that is very noticeable in this graph is, um, you know, given the given the guide to the eye here that I drew for each and every one of the sample sets, is that uh, the superconducting temperature rises for a certain value of the relative volume concentration. Now, this is a fingerprint of triplet superconductivity. For a superconducting ferromagnetic bilayer, if you place a ferromagnetic layer next to a superconducting layer, a regular Cooper pair comprised of a pair of uh, opposite spin electrons 
trying to travel into its neighboring ferromagnetic friend uh, would break very easily due to the fact that the exchange energy is normally much larger than the energy gap in the superconductor. So it doesn't, you know, just goes up and flips back up again. Uh, but if we took a triplet component of this Cooper pair, meaning that both, uh, both spins are aligned in the same direction and perhaps in the direction of the exchange field, then uh, the superconducting component could last for uh, larger uh, thicknesses of the ferromagnet. So here you can see theoretical work done by Radovich uh, using the uh, linearized Usedel diffusive equations for superconducting ferromagnetic uh, multilayers, and you can see this theoretical signature of triplet super superconductivity as a bump in TC as a, as a function of the thickness of the ferromagnetic layer. And on the right, you can see some experimental data done from our, in our lab a couple of years ago for superconducting ferromagnetic multilayers. Um, for information about my own theoretical fits to uh, my data and perhaps to discuss the fact that my grandmother was Chinese, uh, come visit my poster. So, hi everyone, my name is Arbel Chaim, I'm from the Weizmann Institute, and uh, the poster I will present is about uh, current correlations in the Majorana beam splitter. Uh, it is a work done together with Erez Berg, uh, Felix von Hoppen, and uh, Yuval Oreg. And let me give you the main result. Uh, so, the usual setup that one considers when, uh, or when, or a popular setup that one considers when thinking about Majorana fermions is you have a topological superconductor on the right with a Marana uh, bound state on the, on the edge, and you couple the lead to it, and you uh, run a current from the lead to the superconductor, and you look at the current versus voltage, let's say. What we want to do is to couple two leads simultaneously to the Marana uh, bound state, and we want to look at current correlations between these, the, the two currents, I1 and I2. And uh, what we find is that if you look at the correlation P12 as a function of uh, voltage, what you see is that first the correlation is always negative, which is uh, not always the case uh, in uh, other systems. And second, it goes to zero as 1 over V at uh, high voltages. Uh, we show using uh, a simple uh, but the general model that you have a certain universal function which describes these uh, correlations. You can see it is negative and goes to zero. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, we show that this behavior is uh, closely related to the Marana non-locality, namely the, uh, the statement that you cannot probe the occupation of a Marana bound state locally. If you want to know more, you'll have to visit the poster, obviously. Uh, but to finish, let me show you some uh, uh, numerical simulation. So we take this uh, uh, system, we put it on a lattice, and we calculate numerically the scattering matrix from which we can get all, all properties. We, uh, using the Zeeman, uh, go into the topological phase, and we calculate numerically the cross-correlation. So as you can see on the left, uh, it's, again, you see the negative correlation, which goes to zero. And notice that even if I raise the temperature above zero temperature, the main features basically uh, remains. Uh, on the right, you have the differential conductance. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Mordechai Kot. I will be talking, my poster is about uh, hole viscosity in the presence of disorder, and this is work, work done here in Tel Aviv University under the supervision of Moshe Goldstein. Now, we know viscosity links between strain rate and stress, uh, but uh, in order to understand what we mean when we say hole viscosity, consider the following example, an infinite two-dimensional pipe, where the walls of the pipe are moving opposite each other, such that there is some uh, velocity profile in the fluid. Now, normal shear viscosity that we see in daily life, that just makes it so that it'll be harder to move the walls. That creates friction on the walls. However, hall viscosity, which arises in the presence of uh, the breaking of ti time reversal symmetry, such as uh, in the presence of magnetic field, that links between 
components, orthogonal components of strain rate and stress. And in this example, it would lead to something very bizarre, like uh, it changes the pressure on the walls. Now, hole viscosity is very, very important for two-dimensional electron fluids. It has many interesting traits. It's non-dissipative because we saw it links between perpendicular force and flow. Secondly, it's been shown to be topologically protected, and it also can distinguish between different states of the same feeling factor, such as the Mouwid state, Paffian and anti Paffian, something that a measurement of conductivity, say, cannot do. Also, it's been recently linked to conductivity and its derivatives in reciprocal space. And this is measurable by applying a spatially varying electric field. We note here, spatially varying electric field causes spatially varying uh, um, currents, and spatially varying currents remind us of the walls of uh, liquid rubbing against each other that we saw in the example. Now, this seems fairly straightforward. However, now many, many questions still open. Specifically, uh, hole viscosity has only been shown to be topologically protected in um, clean systems, and it's only been linked to conductivity in, um, in Galilean invariant systems, which, among other things, require the system to be uh, clean. So we consider, if we want to measure this in the lab, we need to ask ourselves what happens in the presence of the solder. I mean, uh, will it still be topologically protected, and will it still be linked to the measurable value? And in order to answer these questions, we looked at a numerical model. We looked at integer quantum Hall effect on a square lattice, and we introduced a uh, random potential of varying magnitudes, and we calculated the viscosity in two ways. First, in squares here, by directly through the appropriate Kubo formula for viscosity, and then again through the link to conductivity, and we note a couple of interesting things. First, we note that the viscosity appears to be unchanged even as the solder is introduced. This might indicate that viscosity is still topologically protected even in the presence of the solder. And secondly, we note that the link to conductivity breaks down, sadly. However, it does so in a gradual manner. This means that if our system is not dirty enough, is not too dirty, we might still be able to measure uh, clean viscosity values in our uh, dissolved system. Thank you very much. Okay, so hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Ella and I'll be presenting a poster titled Visualization of Superparamagnetic Dynamics in Magnetic Topological Insulators. The visualization part is done with our tool uh, of scanning squid on tip microscopy. By our, I mean the lab of uh, Eli Zeldov at the Weizmann Institute, uh, which I'll be happy to discuss uh, more about this uh, microscopy, but in general it's a scanning uh, squid technique with a very small squid that has a geometry for scanning, which means that we can get uh, closer to the surface than any other uh, scanning, any other conventional scanning squid uh, method. The magnetic topological insulator is a chromium dope bismuth antimony telluride thin film grown uh, by MBE, and at a temperature of 250 millikelvin, it shows an anomalous uh, Hall effect in, in transport. And if you cool it down to dilution fridge temperatures, um, the values get quantized, and you get the quantum anomalous uh, Hall effect. Uh, if you look at this transport, you say, good, I, I do, the, ma the magnetic dopants turned it into a, a ferromagnet. And indeed, if you uh, look at the magnetic microscopy of the sample and you scan a 5 by 5 micron square, um, so you prepare the system. Uh, can I show you this? So you prepare the system at, at this state near the, the coercive field, and you see that the magnetization is indeed uh, quite disordered. And you scan uh, two uh, consecutive scans, and you change the field by just a little bit, by uh, five, uh, five Gauss. And you see that two, these two uh, scans are quite similar. And if you consider this to be a ferromagnet, then you would expect uh, really not much change. And if there is a change, you would expect to see domain wall motion. So I will show you that there is some change between these two scans by simply subtracting the two. And you see that the change is instead of domain wall motion, these uh, blobs, which means that there were blobs of spins that turned from being blue, which is pointing downwards, to being uh, red, which is pointing upwards. And we can take two other scans and show, uh, again, that the differences um, in a very uh, convincing manner are not of domain wall motions. 
and we can uh, fit each of these uh, switching blobs and uh, um, fit it uh, magnetization change, and we can create a similar magnetization curve and plot it together with the simultaneously measured uh, RXY uh, that's measured in transport, and you see that the, uh, the values uh, sort of fit, so the magnetization that we measure follows uh, RXY, uh, we get to a total of uh, 3 10 to the 8 uh, Bohr magneton, which, is, uh, which accounts for about 80% of the magnetization change. Uh, this is in good agreement with uh, global squid measurements if you normalize to the fact that we only measure a 5 by 5 micron uh, area, uh, which brings me to the point of my poster, which is that the superparamagnetism is the dominant magnetic phase, and if you want to know more about this, you should come look at my poster. Okay, so my name is Aran Sagi, and I'll say a few words about this work uh, done with Yuval Oreg, Adi Stern, and Bert Halperin. And the subject is the fractional quantum Hall effect, and one of the most important properties uh, of these systems is the, is the fact that we have excitations that carry fractional charges, but also fractional statistics. That is, we have anions in our system, and that immediately tells us that if we put our system on a surface of non-trivial topologies such as a torus, it automatically has a ground state degeneracy, and this degeneracy cares only on the underlying topology. Okay? And this is a direct implication of the existence of anions in our system, so naturally we would have been very happy if we could have measured this property, but, but obviously this is very complicated because even if we can uh, put our two DAG on a torus somehow, we would still need magnetic monopoles, and we simply do not have that. So what we wanted to look for is another system realizing essentially the same physics, but with experimentally accessible components. And we came up with such a, such a system, and it's very simple. We start with an electron hole double layer, uh, and we shape it like an annulus, and we put it in the fractional quantum Hall effect, so there are strong magnetic fields here. And now what we want to do is to put superconductors in proximity to the external and the internal edges. And what I would argue, and obviously there are many details involved, is that this system is the same as that one. So uh, now that we have this system, we want uh, to access the degeneracy. We want to be able to experimentally measure it. And there's actually, it turns out that there is a simple way of doing that because we have two superconductors in our system. So what we'll do is we'll measure the Jovelson effect. And I'll just uh, skip to the main result that the periodicity of the Josephson effect turns out to be just 2 pi times that ground state degeneracy we're after. So by measuring the, jo the Josephson effect, we can actually access this degeneracy. And obviously, there are many details involved, so I, uh, so I uh, welcome you to come to my poster. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Raul Santos, and uh, I will talk. Uh, so my poster is about the the talk that uh, Dima just uh, explained to us. So I'm just uh, repeat. I will repeat uh, briefly what he said. We studied um, what's the fate of a uh, otherwise trivial topological uh, insulator with two helical edges uh, in the presence of interactions, and we found that actually. Uh, playing with the interaction between uh, the, the modes compared to the interaction within each mode, uh, we can actually drive the phase into a topological phase, which that means that uh, backscattering is uh, suppressed by the existence of the spin gap. Uh, so uh, if you have more uh, technical questions, please come and visit my post. Thank you.
That wasn't mine. Uh, oops. Uh, hello, my name is Kirill Snishko. I'm uh, presenting a poster with, uh, uh, about work done with Olesh Stanko and Vadim Chiyanov uh, sometime before I moved here to Weizmann. And uh, it's about quantum Hall effect and some nice experiment about it, and we analyzed it theoretically. So, uh, in a generic quantum Hall edge, there are uh, chiral transport channels. Some of them carry electric charge. Some of them carry neutral excitations, but no electric charge. And those can flow in the same way as charge channels or in the opposite way. And the, on top of that, there are some local quasi-particle excitations that are related to these edge channels. And generally, it's pretty well understood, but there is one big problem in every specific case confirming a specific theory is very hard, especially the quasi-particle properties. And there was a beautiful experiment in 2010 by Moti Heibloom's group. What they did, they said, let's have a QPC and tunnel in between two edges, and let's inject current IN in the top left corner. And all the charge channels flow out of the system. So if there are no uh, counter-propagating neutral channels, there is no way uh, what is measured on the right bottom corner, I, will know about the injection of IN. And uh, if there are, then maybe something will tell us about injection of IN. And being more specific, they measured the current on the right bottom corner, and they measured the current noise. And indeed, they found that there is dependence of noise on IN, in, for example, in nu equal two-thirds, which confirms existence of neutral modes qualitatively, because quantitatively you still have to analyze it to make some theory. And that's what we did. Uh, there is one problem, is that if you try to uh, compare your theory for how much current I you'll measure with what experiment tells you there will be a huge uh, discrepancy. This is a well-known problem which unfortunately doesn't have a well-known unique solution. We chose one of, the, uh, one of possible solutions and after treating non-universal physics properly, we have a very good agreement with experimental data. So one can say that the existence of counterflow in neutral modes is confirmed quantitatively, not just qualitatively. Uh, and my poster is about just this. There are some continuations to that story. If you want some details or you want to hear about continuation, please come. I'll quickly put it up. You may start the timer if you like. There we go. Okay, then I need to go to my computer. Sorry, guys. Hello, I'm Jukka Värnen, and uh, I will be talking about some older work, not not about the uh, uh, one you heard of uh, just half an hour ago. Unless you want, I, I can also talk about that. Just come to my poster. Uh, so, but my poster will be mostly about um, basically microscopic mechanism to to give rise to a spin or a, a magnetic impurity um, in a, in a two D TI. And uh, here, here are some uh, related pictures. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks. Perhaps uh, say a few words. Yeah.
Uh, okay, this is a pity because uh, my work is uh, largely graphical. Uh, so I'm working, at, well, I was working on a, a lattice model, which is called the Swedenborg guide lattice model, uh, which is a combination of a Kagame plane and a triangular plane. And this is interesting because uh, on a triangle, on a triangle uh, Ising spins with antiferromagnetic interactions can be frustrated. So this is a work in which not only a physicist, but also the material he studies is frustrated, uh, which also is always find kind of funny. Um, and these materials are highly degenerate in a sense, and this can lead to very interesting phase diagrams. So that is sort of a summary of my, uh, of my poster. If you want to know more about this, then, uh, please come visit me. the presenters for being timely and let's thank all the speakers of the afternoon session.